Here we are. It's Holy Saturday and Easter night is drawing near. When I first began writing this talk, um, I was imagining it all from the standpoint of the Easter Tridium at Worth Abbey. So I was thinking about Holy Saturday and how we enter <coughs> fully into the experience of the Easter Vigil. And I had all the imagery in my mind of us gathering around the blazing fire on the piazza outside the Abbey Church and that whole experience of the liturgy there. So what I need you to do during this talk in your homes um, this afternoon, this evening, is wherever you are to come with me on an imaginative journey, really to try to visualise with me the scenes and to conjure up that atmosphere, the feel, the sounds, the spaces, the symbols. I want us to go on a journey together this evening of welcoming in a new and profound way the grace of God and unpacking some of those central symbols of the Easter Vigil. And all the thoughts that I offer in this talk are intended to help you participate at depth in the events of the Easter night and to help you as you uh, begin your celebration of the Easter Vigil, however you do that in your homes when dark falls tonight. So the symbols we're going to explore are fire, light, water and song. And each of these communicates something about God, about what God is like, and even more particularly about how God communicates himself to us, how God touches us and our lives. That reality of God giving himself, entering into us and our lives that we call grace. Because it's through gr the grace of God that the, the new humanity is formed and the new creation comes to birth, even now, tonight, in our midst. But each of these symbols also tells us something about us, a quality or a need in us, in our humanity, and an effect that grace will have on us. So if God is a blazing fire, he is consuming the dead wood of the old creation. If God is light, he is permeating the darkness of our hearts and lives. If God is living water, he is cleansing us and bringing us to new birth. If God is song, then he is bringing to an end the suppression of song in us and animating us with praise. So as I speak, use your imaginations and really try and listen with your hearts to allow these words to penetrate at a deeper level so that as you're listening and as you enter into the liturgy tonight, you're really able to let grace touch into a deep place in yourselves through these images. <clears throat> so fire. Let's imagine we are gathered in full darkness late tonight around a blazing Paschal fire. And I do hope that you will create some kind of fire at home, not in your houses, in your gardens. Now the priest um, begins the solemn liturgy with the words, Dear brothers and sisters, on this most sacred night, in which our Lord Jesus Christ passed over from death to life. The church calls upon her sons and daughters scattered throughout the world to come together to watch and pray. If we keep the memorial of the Lord's Paschal Solemnity in this way, listening to his word and celebrating his mysteries, then we shall have the sure hope of sharing his triumph over death and living with him in God. The words make it clear. This journey tonight is our journey. If we choose to go tonight with him spiritually, through word and symbol, through death and into life. 
So as we imagine ourselves gathered around that fire, the wood is spitting and crackling, the flames are leaping. The wood symbolises the dead wood of the cross upon which Christ hung, crucifying death itself. As a Dominican friend of mine once put it in a talk, Christ put death to death by death. The wood also symbolises us, our humanity without grace, dry and brittle. The wood is burning and the light is rising. The wood of the cross is dying and the light of Christ is rising. In the flames of this new fire, the old creation with all its bitterness, tragedy and sorrow is dying, consumed in the fire of love and transformed into blazing light. St John of the Cross used the imagery of a log and fire to explore the journey of transformation in God that the church traditionally calls divinization or deification. That process by which we, as God's creatures, are made through grace, partakers of God's own divine nature. And just in case that idea has never crossed your radar before, yes, we are called to become divine. That's what God made us for. And it's the work he's trying to carry out in us right now. The work which we are called to cooperate with. In St John's metaphor, when a new log is thrown into the fire, that log is still green and fresh, and at first it sizzles, pops and steams. It's not yet ready to become inflamed. First, all the moisture must be drawn to the surface and evaporated. And this moisture is like the imperfections of the human soul, our sins, our vices, our anxieties and fears, our control and resistance to God, all that is not in conformity with God within us. And as the moisture from the log is evaporated, eventually that log begins to catch fire itself and the log is transformed in fire. St John writes, the fire has penetrated the wood, transformed it, and united it with itself. And as this fire grows hotter and continues to burn, so the wood becomes much more incandescent and inflamed, even to the point of flaring up and shooting out flames from itself. So the log is increasingly becoming one with the fire. The distinction between the two becomes blurred. This is the process we call divinization, the process by which God's own life so fills and permeates ours that divine life now pulses through our veins. The fire symbolises the love of God as it purifies the soul and causes it to radiate light and heat, now even beginning to shoot out flames of love itself. Now you might be thinking this sounds painful, and you'd be right. There is a kind of pain in being transformed. And that's precisely why so often we do turn away from God and put up barriers um, to him. We turn away from that path that leads to healing and freedom. But when we begin to enter deep into a contact with God in prayer, St John of the Cross says we experience our souls wounded by love. The heart is pierced with the love of God like an arrow and this wounding is both delightful and painful. As one Lenten hymn puts it, our souls long to feel love's welcome pain. So how do we welcome this transformation tonight and in our lives? Let us first interiorly acknowledge the truth of our broken and fragile humanity. Let us bring the dead wood of our lives to God in prayer, with all the toxins and imperfections which need the purification of divine love. 
Let us stand before God as we are tonight. No masks, no self-editing, but real with the bitterness and deathliness, the resentments, the brittleness, the discord with others, the narrowness of our hearts, the fearfulness with which we cling to life for ourselves and that contempt that we harbour for others the laziness which holds us back from sacrificing ourselves in so many small daily ways and our attachments to comforts. All of this is dead wood. So let us metaphorically hurl ourselves again into that fire of divine love and let him burn us up completely, bringing us into the fullness of the new creation to become the people he has created us to be, people ablaze with love and life. Light, the next symbol. The next part of the Easter Vigil is the lighting and procession of the Paschal candle from that blazing Paschal bonfire and the sharing of the light. The Paschal candle is brought to the priest and he cuts into it with a knife, carving the cross and the symbols of Alpha and Omega and the year, saying these words. Now, you really have to imagine worth now and uh, the solemnity of Abbot Luke, who says these words with unrivalled gravity. Christ, yesterday and today, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. All time belongs to him and all the ages. To him be glory and power through every age and forever. Amen. We then follow the candle in procession. So again, really uh, imagine Worth Church. At Worth, this symbolism is particularly powerful because the Paschal bonfire is out on the piazza and then we follow the candle into the entrance area, the narthex, and then down those stairs and into the church below. And the church is architecturally incredible for the Easter liturgy because it has this vast cave-like quality. And the church is plunged into total darkness, giving it this tomb-like feel. And that's exactly the point. As we go down the stairs into the church, we go down with Christ into the heart of the earth. Now for our celebration of this mystery of Holy Saturday night to really make sense, we must first have fully engaged with the reality of Good Friday in its total desolation. There's no pretense on Jesus's part in what happens on the cross or behind the scenes after his death. During that silence of Holy Saturday, Jesus Christ is truly dead. As the theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar describes so profoundly in his writings on Easter, Jesus descends into hell, not as the risen Lord, triumphant in power, but as a dead man. In death, all power is stripped away. The victory will come, but not yet. First, there is the total silence and passivity of death. The journey of Jesus, even from the Annunciation and his conception in Mary's womb, is one of progressive self-surrender. In his ministry, love takes a more active form, teaching, healing. But progressively this shifts towards a total stripping of active power. He loves until the very end. A love manifested in the total laying down of self. This passivity into which he moves is anything but apathy or resignation. Rather, it is love in its most radical form. Jesus hands himself over to death itself for death to do its worst 
to him. At 3pm on Good Friday, active surrender is fulfilled and he cries out, it is accomplished, it is consummated. Now he falls as a dead man into the depths of separation from God himself. Here in radical powerlessness, he has nothing to give, nothing to contribute. Here in this place of God forsakenness, the spirit comes to him and imparts as sheer gift the power of resurrection. When we gather in total darkness tonight, and please do this in your homes, turn out all the lights and really engage with this symbolism. It, the, in the darkness, it's this radical dimension of the death of Christ that is symbolised. We, in our humanity, cannot conjure up light from darkness or life from death. We find ourselves in the situation of radical dependence and are invited by grace at work within us to turn this powerlessness into receptivity. We are called to be like the tomb in its darkness and deathliness, awaiting the infilling of a light that transforms the tomb into a womb, into a place of rebirth. God wants to pour his grace into our deepest roots and to welcome grace to touch us right into our depths, we must first stand in our poverty. This is where Holy Saturday night meets the Annunciation. Like Mary, we're on our knees. We have nothing to offer, no power, but we can open up this poverty to the incoming of grace. Like Mary, we can become unimpeded openness to God. And it's precisely in this that the locus of our true power is found, our true freedom, the very essence, in fact, of our humanity made to be a response to God, made to be a yes to God. So in this yes, we touch the centre point of creation. Standing in the tomb of the church, that light of the paschal candle now enters into our darkness, bringing fertility where there was a sterile void. God's gift of himself meets our yes and new life is born. Like the Annunciation, this fertility is not of human origin, but is of God. Sheer gift, meeting the receptivity of the creature's yes to the creator. So as we follow that candle into the darkness tonight, we stop at three times to sing Lumen Christi, and we all cry, Deo gracias, thanks be to God. Just think for a moment about light as one of the elements. I'm not a scientist, by the way, so if my science is wrong, I apologise. But to think about what light tells us about God's grace and how it touches into us, because light spreads swiftly and noiselessly, and it permeates everything where it meets no barrier or block. As light hits objects, the object is illuminated and reflects light itself. So in God's light, we too become light. As John's Gospel says, the light has shone in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. Water, our next symbol. Now there's so much that we could say about the imagery of water in the liturgy and in the scriptures. It's so rich. But I want to focus on just one idea. Normally at an Easter vigil, catechumens would be baptised. 
Tonight would have been that incredible moment of new beginning in which they would die with Christ in the waters of baptism and rise with him into the new life of Easter. It's truly sad that that can't take place in our churches tonight. However, absolutely fundamental to our Christian faith is the renewal of our baptismal promises, which we are called to make every year, we are called to make tonight. If you do one thing tonight, please renew your baptismal promises. So we can do this in our homes and we can do it with great power and meaning. So whether you're live streaming a mass later on um, or you're following our liturgy at home guides or a, or a combination of the two, a central aspect of the shared experience that we will all have as Christians, as Catholics all over the world tonight, will be the sprinkling of holy water and the renewing of our baptismal promises. So let's just reflect on um, one aspect of the significance of this action for us. In the original creation, Genesis describes how the earth was a formless void. There was darkness over the deep and God's spirit hovered over the water. We need to have this imagery in mind as we imaginatively come to the baptismal font tonight and sprinkle the holy water. We as creatures were made by God out of nothing, out of nothing, formed from the formless void to have life and purpose. And yet there is a tendency within us towards chaos. We have inside of us a space that left unformed and unfilled tends towards the chaos of non-being. It's like a, a fault line within the human person and we call it sin. Saint Augustine helped us to clarify what sin is by describing it as an absence of the good. Where the good should be, there is instead nothing, absence, a void. And we see the effects of this absence, this void in our lives, in all of those ways in which we fall short of love and turn in inwards in selfish self-preservation. We sh fall short of the dignity and the grandeur of the human vocation made in God's image to manifest his glory. We were made by God to be filled with his own life. And so this void tends towards destruction when it is not opened up to be filled with the divine life. In the Paschal Mystery, God is recreating the world through the death and resurrection of Christ, and we become a new creation. We enter personally and sacramentally into this reality of being wholly refashioned in Christ through baptism and through the renewal of our baptismal promises which we'll be doing in a couple of hours time. Like the first creation, which was formed out of nothing, out of darkness and chaos, the new creation is brought into being from the nothingness, the utter void of the death of Jesus Christ, true God and true man. This same cre creative action God now wants to work within each of us to draw us forth from our chaos to a new Eden, full of fruitfulness and abundance. So let's come into tonight's liturgy, bringing our own inner chaos, our inward tomb, to come recognising our neediness and instability, that restlessness that leaves us teetering on the brink of nothingness when it's not oriented towards our true goal, God. The spirit hovers anew over the void and as we consent to his creative action and symbolically enter into the waters of the font, we are reborn. As Saint Paul says in the letter to the Romans, do you not know that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, 
we too might walk in newness of life. Song. The final symbol, the final action that I want to reflect on. During Lent, we don't sing the Gloria or the A word. Two significant songs of praise that express the joy inherent in our Christian faith. Song forms a significant part of human expression in all cultures, all over the world and throughout the whole of history. So as human beings, we were made to sing. During Lent, we've suppressed songs of joy and waited in a kind of silence. On Palm Sunday and on Maundy Thursday, we do sing, but our song is tinged with sadness as the shadow of death covers us with the looming passion of Christ. After Jesus' final cry, it is accomplished. Good Friday becomes a day of radical silence, which continues into Holy Saturday. Song has been extinguished, seemingly forever. Singing expresses something innate in us, that we have been made for praise. Yet part of the experience of the fall is that we have lost our true song as human beings, our innate dignity and our destiny of eternal festivity has been obscured from the sight of man. Tonight, as Christ rises victorious from the grave, raising our broken humanity from its oppressed and distorted state into the fullness of our destiny in the kingdom of everlasting joy, song is restored. Through the Paschal mystery, we are transformed and take on the new humanity of Christ. And so our lives, like Christ's life, become God's self-communication, his song. So tonight we should sing our hearts out. There's a stunning sequence before the gospel from the Feast of Corpus Christi that was written by St Thomas Aquinas. I had the incredible experience last June of being in Jerusalem um, and my first day in the Holy Land was Corpus Christi. Uh, I found my way to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and wondered whether there would be a special celebration and sure enough there it was. I found myself at the, the front of a mass that was being celebrated at the door of the tomb where Jesus rose from the dead. Um, and the mass uh, itself, the, the um, consecration took place by the Patriarch of Jerusalem inside the tomb on the marble slab upon which um, the body, the dead body of Jesus Christ was laid and his body rose from the dead. After the mass, there was a procession of the Blessed Sacrament around um, the tomb. I mean, just imagine this, a procession of the living body, the risen body of Jesus Christ, walking three times around the tomb uh, into which his dead body was laid. Um, it was a very awesome experience. But the words um, of this sequence before the gospel really struck me as they were sung in that mass. Praise, O Zion, thy saviour. Praise thy leader and thy shepherd in hymns and canticles. As much as thou canst, so much darest thou. For he is above all praise nor art thou able to praise him enough. We cannot praise him enough. And I don't think that Aquinas in these words is simply telling us to sing a song of praise, but rather he is urging us to be a song of praise, to allow our lives to be a song of praise, to dare to live our lives fully in the joy of the Holy Spirit. This is our innate calling. Um, a Benedictine nun, nun Abbess Cecile Brière, probably pronouncing that wrong, wrote, joy is the distinguishing atmosphere of the Christian life. 
the perfect expression of the soul consecrated to God. She said our joy springs from being saturated with God. A Benedictine monk friend of hers, Don Prosper Guéranger, wrote, Be Alleluia from head to toe. I love that. Be Alleluia from head to toe. There's an electricity in the Easter life, and our reality is an Easter people. As Saint Augustine said, we are an Easter people, and Alleluia is our song. Even in the midst of sadness and struggle, when we do not feel joyful at the level of experience and emotions, nonetheless we can choose joy, because Christ has had the ultimate victory. His grace has touched into our deepest place of despair and begins to transfigure it from the inside. Tonight, we will encourage you all to listen or even to sing the words of the Easter Exultet, the Easter proclamation, which again expresses this idea. It says, let this holy building shake with joy, filled with the mighty voices of the peoples. What a great image. Often our Catholic liturgy and its solemnity can have a bit of a sedate quality, but here, in the words of a most ancient Easter proclamation, we hear that our voices should be so loud that the very building shakes. There's nothing buttoned up about this. Imagine if tonight Christians burst forth into song all throughout our cities and the buildings shook with the thundering sounds of joy. I don't know how bold you feel able to be in your homes, wherever you are, with whoever you're with. with. But remember, dare all you can. Don't let self-consciousness hold you back. Do not suppress your song, but sing your hearts out, because Jesus Christ, our King, is risen. So the invitation now um, is to spend some time pondering what you've heard and taking some time in, in prayer and reflection, also to, to think about some questions that I'm going to give you and feel free over the next hour or two to share some thoughts or responses that you have from this talk and from um, the questions on Facebook. You can put them as comments under um, this video um, and then you're able to hear what other people think, what other people's reflection has been um, and to respond to each other. So here are your questions. What speaks personally to you from what I've shared? Which image of grace speaks most strongly to you? Fire, light, water, song. Where in yourself can you recognise the need for grace? Where in yourself can you recognise that dead wood, the darkness, the chaos, or the suppression of song? And we'd invite you really before the vigil starts tonight to give some time to welcome grace in a new way, into yourself, into your life.